So we live in a world where technology determines how we live, learn, and earn. And the internet has become our new public square, our gateway to information, innovation, and even revolution. But where many people have benefited from the gains in technology, there are still millions of people who have not, and they are underserved. And the word underserved is most often used to describe people who lack adequate access to resources, whether we're talking technology or income or education or race or physical capability. The underserved is a case of the have versus have-nots. And when we're referring to the internet, this disparity is known as the digital divide. And the digital divide has been analyzed, discussed, and studied for well over 15 years. But many people have tried to figure out why it exists. But in this hinge moment, there are new digital inequalities that are not even about access to the internet, but rather inequalities in how technology and the internet is being used and benefits some, but not everyone because this is what's creating the new winners and losers. And this is what's creating a new underserved. So today, I'd just like to propose a new way to think about this new group of underserved people. And now, like the tax code or poverty, it's a big issue, so we're not going to solve it all today. But I would like to share some ideas about how to better address the divisions that are created by the adoption of new technologies. So who are the new underserved? What do they even look like? Well, it's the senior who has access to a computer, but still doesn't know how to use the internet to benefit his daily life. Or it's the independent filmmaker who can afford a $15 Netflix account, but she can't quite afford $100 for internet that's bundled in a cable and home phone package. It's the young startup innovators who are working on the latest and greatest apps, but they have to still go to a local coffee shop in order to get fast, cheap internet. Or it's the young single mother who only relies on her mobile phone for internet access, so now she can't check her kids' grades or apply for a job to raise her household income. So this perspective that I have about the underserved comes from my family's business. So my father started Wilco Electronic Systems in the late 70s. And during those early days of telecom, there were hundreds of cable companies, right? They were small and large and publicly and privately owned all throughout the city and all throughout the country. But over time, all of these companies have either been bought, merged, squeezed out of business, or consolidated, period but we are still here. <laughs> and most likely we're still here because we were able to find a niche in the marketplace of providing affordable cable services to people who are underserved or overlooked. That became our secret sauce. Because there were many companies that didn't even want to enter these communities. They didn't know really how best to engage them. So here we are. We're one of the last of the remaining small telecom providers that still knows the communities that we serve. And it is my belief that we still exist because we have a staunch commitment to providing personalized services to those communities who are still today underserved and overlooked. So here are some lessons that I learned from being an operator and a provider to this marketplace. So one, people want personalized service. They want to know that their voices are being heard and that their concerns are being met. So for instance, people who live in the community that we serve have my mobile number. They can call me on my cell phone on a Saturday night to tell me that they're having a problem with their cable company, and they use that number. They have no shame. But, Imagine if you could call like Mark Zuckerberg and say on a Friday night, yeah, hey, Mark, yeah, hey, my Facebook's not working. I'm gonna need somebody to come fix that. Yeah, that would never happen, but it happens to me, and that's okay. Um, two, people want multiple ways to pay for their service. 
Not everybody has a credit card, and not everybody has access to that plastic economy. Three, people just want to pay for what they need. So unbundled packages work great. And they allow and afford families to actually afford the services. But one of the biggest lessons that I learned, one of the most important lessons, actually, that I learned, is that the face of the underserved is not who you think. It's not one group, and it's not one single profile. And to effectively serve them, we have to address all their voices. And this is important, because in this moment, right now, there's a shift that's taking place in our culture. Old technology is becoming new technology. What once was cable is now the internet. So cable companies are now more so broadband providers. And mobile phone companies are now more so broadband providers, particularly for, for those who have no other way of getting online. And for a society where the internet will become like electricity, invisible yet more deeply embedded into our daily life, how we envision its future is crucial for all of us. So this is not going to be easy. I mean, there's going to be some challenges trying to do that. Because given the speed at which technology evolves, some people are just not going to be able to keep up. They just don't know or won't know how to use the internet to benefit their daily life. So this has to deal with personal aptitude. <coughs> given the complexities of certain applications, without that right hardware, that means you don't get the benefit of the technology. So let's say someone doesn't have that smartphone or that computer to easily navigate and engage in those whiz-bang apps and internet resources, then they're going to get left behind. And this has to deal with the size and diversity of the network. Because ultimately, the network has to be able to address the varying needs of everyone. And lastly, internet is costly, right? It's expensive, right? And that applies to everybody, even in this room. And if there's a lack of diversity of providers in the area, that means either people are going to get priced out of the market, or we just don't get the benefit of having multiple providers to choose from for our internet service. And that deals with cost structure. And when you combine all of these circumstances, they create the new underserved. So then how can we best address these divisions? What are the best ideas that we can pull together and integrate into a new vision for the internet? Well, in these last few moments, I'd just like to share a few ideas. So a couple weeks ago, I conducted a small experiment asking people in one word, what does the word of the internet mean to you? And this is what came up, this beautiful array of responses that was a pure reflection of what people actually think about the internet. And if you see the words, you'll see access and information came up quite frequently. But look at the other words that came up, right? Collaboration, exchange, freedom, innovation, liberty, profit, right? Ubiquity, equality. 15 years ago, if you had asked this question, it would have been answered so differently. And 15 years from now, if you ask this question, it's going to be answered completely differently, right? So what this says to me is that any consideration of how to best shape the future of the internet has to take into account the entire broadband ecosystem rather than just the individual elements. And the ecosystem, of course, includes the applications and the network and the devices and the content. But more importantly, it encompasses the users, the people. And we, we are the people. So in the future, many new voices are going to have to be at the table to tell us how technology is used and built out and designed and optimized. And we're going to have to get much more collaborative in how we address and create solutions. So following these thoughts, 
This led me to my second idea. So the national debate on the future of the internet has focused almost exclusively on its impact on our lives as consumers, but not necessarily as citizens. So one line of thinking is that, as a society, we should stop looking at the internet as just a profit-making service offering, but rather reposition the internet as also a fundamental civil rights issue. And thankfully, in this past year, there have been many events and calls to action that have helped to push that conversation forward. So in November of 2014, President Obama issued out a call to action to enact the strongest possible rules to protect net neutrality. And net neutrality, in its simplest form, because it's a very complicated and complex issue, but it's basically the, the idea that all traffic on the internet should be treated equally. It should be open. Additionally, the president also proposed that the internet should be regulated as a utility rather than just a service offering. So a utility, like, wow. I mean, so basically the president was saying that the government should now have some control on how we get the internet, how it's protected, and that it's open for everyone to freely communicate on it. Like, what? Okay, Mr. President. Like, that was groundbreaking. And I don't think many people even thought that message would come from the White House when it did, but it did and it happened. And it was so groundbreaking that it started a ripple effect. Because then, then three months later, in February of 2015, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, passed new net neutrality regulations protecting the open internet. And it was called the Open Internet Order. And the order sought to ban internet service providers from blocking access to content, throttling traffic on the basis of that content, or then favoring some content providers over others. So like, there was a lot of legislative change that was happening this year. It was a great, momentous year. Again, another sign that we're in this hinge moment. But what I thought was so interesting was that as all of these policy changes were taking place in Washington, D.C., Nations were talking, they were marching. Young, old, black, white, rich, poor, from France to Ferguson, all these people were coming together to protest and to collaborate and to call out for change. Technology and social media was literally spawning a new 21st century civil rights movement. So they were basically exercising their First Amendment rights to call out inequalities but they were doing it all online. So when they said that revolution won't be televised, <laughs> well, that revolution was not only being televised, that revolution was being uploaded and downloaded and streamed and posted and tweeted all through the use of the internet. And these issues weren't just about Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter. They called attention to various socioeconomic concerns, such as full employment, or quality housing, or education, or mass incarceration, or the ban to, to racial profiling, or the ban to end terrorism. Basically, the lack of rights. So how this all comes together is that if we get back down to the basics of what the internet symbolizes, it's free speech. It's the First Amendment. Free speech, the First Amendment. And ironically, the net neutrality debate started out as a First Amendment conversation years ago, because that's what the internet has become. So it's net neutrality protections that are allowing all these organizers and protesters to spread their message around the world through all these websites and portals uninterrupted. It's become our society's protection to communicate freely. And in this hinge moment, that is essential. And that's why it's important to reframe this conversation. And the conversation, again, needs to include the following, increased collaboration between government, citizens, and industry. Two, more voices at the table. And three, repositioning the internet as a fundamental civil rights issue. So in the end, we've come a long way 
from the 70s when my father first started out in cable, and that jack-in-the-wall was just used for entertainment. Because in this new era of the internet, that jack-in-the-wall means so much more. And much remains uncertain. I mean, we don't know what it's going to look like or what it's going to happen. But by allowing ourselves to explore and rehearse various models and perspectives, this will help us imagine all of the ways that people have different relationships with technology. Because if we do that, then we'll find new ways of going from being underserved to more people being abundantly served. Because ultimately, the internet is what we make it, all together, we the people. And the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And if we're able to do that, then as a society, we will be on that path to creating a new digital equality for all. Thank you.